Uh, okay, so last time we were talking about implicit differentiation, things like that. I want to move on from that. We're a little behind on the schedule. I want to try and catch up a little bit. I guess before I start that, I should remind you that we have a midterm on November 11th. No, wait a 13, thank you. This is a Wednesday. This will be here. I won't be here. Um, actually, I guess I can ask, would people prefer, so, so on November, November 11th, I will have another A-named person cover the class for me. Um, and basically just review stuff and go over problems. Yeah. Yes, his name is Art. His last name is Luke Cody, but so on the 11th, Arden will come for me. Um, but if people would prefer, actually, not to have a review and have the midterm on the 11th, nobody prefers that, right? OK. Then we won't do that. I won't even mention it anymore. Forget I ever said it. OK. And this will cover chapters 5 and 6 and maybe a little of 7. So five and six, we should finish chapter six either today or Monday. I'll start chapter seven, which is on integration. So probably there might be one question on integration. Depends on how things go. Um, okay. Okay. So so. One of the things that one uses single variable calculus for a lot is if you have some function y equals f of x and you want to find the maximum and the minimum. So we might want to maximize y equals f of x. So this is one thing that is a major use of single variable calculus. And this, we have a similar situation with multivariables. This really only makes any sense to talk about the largest or the smallest value. So this is a single variable. And this comes down to, we look at the derivative, set it to zero, find the critical points, determine which critical point is the biggest. If it's on a small inter, if it's on a compact region, we might have to check the ends as well. The same thing applies in more than one variable. Of course, in this case, we really only have the situation where f takes several variables to one variable, where we might look for the smallest or the largest value here. Right? If, if we have more than one variable, we can't talk about largest because, I mean, if I'm going from, from R3 to R2, I don't know which way is largest. I don't know whether largest is in the x direction or the y. Okay. In the x direction or the y direction or some combination. So it really only makes sense to talk about maximizing something where we have biggest and smallest built in. So that's, right, so I'm going to take some space into some take some blob there into some other blob there. Um, and often, just like here, we might have no maximum or no minimum. Here also we might have no maximum or no minimum, unless we restrict ourselves to a nice compact region. Um, so let's first remind what it means to talk about a maximum or a minimum or something like that. These are all fading even the new one that I brought. Uh, this one just came out of the box and it still does not seem good. But I'll try it. Okay, so some function 
R in the R has an absolute maximum. Let's just define the maximum, and then I'll replace it for minimum. At some point, x naught is the vector. If well, what does this mean? It means that if when we evaluate the function at f of x naught, which is a number, then it's the maximum, so it's bigger or maybe equal to f of x for all <coughs> x's that I can plug in. The biggest value would be the maximum. And I guess we could change this to minimum if we replace this. Right. So that's not at all confusing. Uh, let's say x in the domain. Because I'm really maybe going to want to restrict f to some smaller set. And then we also say that we have a local or relative minimum. Uh, why am I switching from max to minimum? A local or a relative maximum. Well, here it means that for everything near x naught, it's the biggest value. But maybe far away, there's something bigger. So, so there's some little neighborhood. Uh, 
subtracting one, so it's a mass. No, that was right. Okay. So that has, you know, an entire line of minima. And that's a perfectly nice function. So. Okay. Um, so, one theorem that is the same as the theorem in the single variable case says that, so suppose that I have my function f, oh, I won't, I called it s here, I'm still going to call it s. So I have some function s, f, on some set s <coughs> in the r, and I don't care if it's differentiable or whatever, and, but I do care, I want s, s to be closed and bounded. So these words are also sometimes go by the name compact. So it includes its endpoints, and it doesn't go off to infinity. Uh, then if f is continuous on s, it, there, it achieves its max and minima. So there is an x naught and y naught, maybe many. So that uh, there's a f has, so these are in s. Uh, an absolute maximum, an x naught, and a minimum. In other words, on a compact set, so in the single variable case, we're talking about a closed interval, a, fun a continuous function has a maximum minimum. So, right, in one variable, I'm just talking about closed interval from A to B, and this is the graph of F, and its minimum value happens to occur at the end, up here is its maximum, and here are some other useless points. Right? The same kind of thing happens for functions of more than one variable. Uh, but in functions of more than one variable, we have sort of more complicated boundary behavior. Um, so rather than, so let's, let's take an easy example. Uh, which one did I do? Four. So minus four x, x minus x squared minus one, minus, wait a minute, I want that square, right? Yes? Minus y times y squared minus 1, if you think of that function, takes r2 to r, and, and what do the maxima and the minima look like? So I drew this on my computer earlier, so I don't want you on. What does that say right there? So it has a maximum, it has a minimum. Okay, so let me make that bigger. So we have here sort of the graph. There's the graph of F over the region minus 2 to 2. Uh, and here is, well, here's a, a relative minimum here. The absolute maxima seem to be here and here, and the absolute minima seem to be here and here. Um, just, it's a little bit hard to see, and turn the lights off, that's okay, exactly what it looks like in here. So let's, let's zoom in a little bit. So this is just the graph of, 
that function. Uh, if I zoom in a little bit on a slightly smaller region, oh come on, maybe I don't care if it's constrained. No, why am I going to go up? I don't know. Anyway, so you can see that you know in that in that little flat spot on the top, there's a there's a hole in the middle where it bumps bumps down. It looks sort of like a chair. Not a very comfortable chair. Maybe maybe it looks like a pot. I don't know. There's sort of a, a hole in the middle and a place for you to set your hands on. Anyway, splish splash. Splish splash. Yeah, you can Anyway, sit here. Uh, so at I guess I didn't say the theorem yet. Um, okay. So so here, if I if I'm trying to maximize f. Over, over this region, which is x between plus and minus 2 and y between plus and minus 2, I might be distracted by this minima here, which is very even hard to see, that minima in the center, and these two little bumps here. And, and all of the maxima and the minima on this guy occur on the, on the boundary. But if I zoom in a little bit on some smaller region like this, then, well, that still happens, but if I go in an even smaller region, then maybe my maxima, you know, if I cut it off here, then my maxima could be there, and my minima could be in there. So depending over what, what region you're looking at, the maxima and the minima could be different things. You do exactly the same process that you do in single variable calculus when you're looking for maxima and minima. You identify the critical points, and then you also check the boundaries check the edges, the endpoints. It's just that in several variables, the endpoints are a much more complicated thing. Right? Here the endpoint is a bunch of lines, a bunch of, yeah. So let's, let me take one more example here. So I'll come back to this one in a bit. Uh, let's take another example, say, g of xy is a nice simple function um, oh, let me draw, I'm not draw the picture yet. Uh, it's a nice simple function. Where did I put the 2? I put the 2 on the y. x squared plus 2y squared. I'm keeping these functions relatively simple because I'm going to have to take derivatives and I don't want to work hard. Um, and I want to consider, so I want to maximize g over the region x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. So the graph of g here, um, let me just draw it here. I'll put it up there in a second. g, this is x squared plus y squared, so it looks like a paraboloid, except this 2 sort of stretches it out. I'll make a picture in a second. So I get a bowl-like shape where the bowl is longer uh, in, of course I just do it longer in the x direction, but it's okay. It's longer in one direction than the other, and I want to maximize it over the part in the unit circle, which is going to be slightly more complicated. So rather than me drawing it wrong, let me just put this same picture up there. So here, of course, my bowl shape, because the computer likes to draw my pictures over a square. Uh, right, so it goes up more here if I go out to the square. Here is the unit circle. This color should terrible. Oh, well. Should I turn the light off? Is it better if I turn the light off? No? Okay, so that's much better, right? So here's the circle. If I lift the circle up to the surface, I get this uh, bent hula hoop that's higher here, and higher here, and lowest here, and lowest here. Okay? So the problem I want to solve is to find, so here, the absolute minimum is right here at zero. That would be easy to check. And then the maxima seem to be here and here. So the boundary of the region that I care about 
is, is, is a circle, it's still a little more complicated. Okay? So, I'm going to that on. Yeah. And I'm going to put this one on. Yeah. I'll leave that one. Uh, which one is right? That one. Good. Okay, so just like in, so let's think about first on the inside part. So, so suppose I have f, uh, well I have f being a nice function. It doesn't mean to be continuous and differentiable, it's more than differentiable. And um, I have some on some region U in Rn, so F taking Rn R. And suppose I have some extreme value. point x where f is either the largest or the smallest. And what do we know about f? The derivative is zero. Well we don't, it's not exactly the derivative, but so then the gradient of f, because f is a function from many variables to one, so we have a gradient. So the gradient of f of x naught has to be zero. And here it's a zero vector because the gradient is a vector. We have the, the zero vector there. Now why should that be? Yeah? The gradient points to where you go that most increase by drawing there. Okay, so intuitively we could just say since uh, the gradient points in the direction of max increase. And if you're at a maximum, you can't go up anymore, so there's nowhere for it to point. Or if you're at a minimum, everywhere points up. And so there's no one where that can point up. So in both cases, it can't point up. Because either it wants to point lots of ways, or there's no way for it to point. Okay. Visually, it has to be a horizontal plane. Yeah. 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 So, well, I mean, you have a slip. So, another way you can think of it is that there's a tangent plane here. Of course, this plane could be a hyperplane, but you have a tangent plane there, and all of the slopes have to be zero. Yeah. This symbol? Yeah. Subset. So U sits inside of R. Maybe it's all of R. So it's the analog of this, but this is a single point, and this is a whole set. Sorry for just using set notation randomly, and it's too bad to get used to it. I'm sorry? Is that like a C or a semester? It's like a C, but it's not a C. It's like a Chinese U. Yeah, it's like a U. I, it's, it's like a sans serif U, but yeah. Uh, I was kind of, it's actually, I mean, I think it comes from a C for contain. But, and then the underline means maybe it could be the whole thing. Some people write this, but sometimes you just write that, and sometimes you might see that, which means it's contained, but it's not everything. And you probably will never see this one, which means it's compact, but we won't use that one. Okay. I don't need it now. <laughs> um, yeah. So can't you qualify that statement by saying it's, it's an interior point of view because like... Yes. Uh, extreme point for F. Thank you for pointing that out. I need that absolutely interior to you. I can show you where it is in my notes. It's right here. I'm on the wrong page. But anyway, it's right here. Uh, so
So we have some interior point, and it's it's important that it be interior. Or you could be you could be an open set where every point is interior in the world. Okay. Uh, anyway, so we have an interior point. Then we have to then the maximum has to occur, has to have the gradient zero. Another way, let me not. I can write proof if you want, but another way you could prove this a little more formally is just as Nick said, all of the directions have to be slope zero. In other words, if I write f, well, let me just leave that off. Uh, f of x, I can write this. No. So the functions. f of fix one value fix all the values but one to get functions from r to r so I'm going to fix so, just, so this is f restricted to a coordinate line Right? Then these have to have a match. So that means that the partial has to be zero there. If the partial has to be zero there. Then since all the partials are zero, <coughs> since all the partials are zero, that means the gradient is zero. So um, I can prove it a little formally, more formally, but, but what about like the function of like x squared minus y squared is zero, zero, because yeah. at that degree it would be zero, but it's not a... Notice that it says, if it's an extreme point, then the gradient okay. is zero. All right. The gradient is zero doesn't mean it's an extreme point. Exactly in the same situation, the exact same thing happens in one variable. Right? In one variable, here is a critical point, here is a critical point, and here is a critical point. All of these have zero slope. Zero slope doesn't mean that you're an extreme value. But extreme value means you have zero slope. Yeah? So isn't it not really true I said that gradient points to the, the, the direction of highest increase? Because at that point in the middle, it would be zero. If there is a gradient, if there's a non-zero gradient, it points in the direction of maximal increase. If the gradient is zero, then the gradient is zero. Right? So, again, right here, we have to look at a higher derivative to see that it goes up. So in this case, the first derivative is zero. The second derivative is also zero. Anyway, the, in this case, eventually there will be a non-zero derivative, which tells us which way is up. But we have to work a little harder. Right? So exactly the same situation can happen here. As you mentioned, we could have, we could have a saddle, which goes down in one direction and up in the other direction. And at this point, which is, in fact, I guess the screen is still up there. Uh, right here, for example, right at this point, it goes up in this direction and down in this direction. This is not a local max or a local min, but the gradient is zero. Just like in one variable where we can have critical points where, where uh, or not local maxes or mins. Okay. Um, so that, that gives us a way, and of course I just erased the example I was going to do. That's nice. Um, that gives us a way to identify relative extrema. So, um, minus for x squared x minus 1 
squared minus y, y squared minus 1. So that's my function, which if I multiply this out, this will leave over more there. So if I take the gradient here, then I will get, this is dead when I take the derivative with respect to x, and here I get, I'm just going to leave the 4 there, 4x uh, four cubed minus 2x, and here I get minus 3y squared minus minus. One. And so this will be zero. So I don't know what this is. Uh, this is, I can take more out. Eight x x squared minus two. Well, this is just what it is. So let's put the minus back in. Three y squared. One. So I'll get the critical point at x equals zero or x equals somehow somehow I think I lost the two x squared two x squared by I took the derivative wrong? No. I factored it wrong. Oh, it's the half. Right? No. I took the x out and I get 4x squared minus 2. That was fine. Yeah, thank you. And then it was in yeah. Doesn't matter because we get the same answer. Okay, so I get x is plus or minus one over root two, right? Because this the square has to be a half in order to kill it with the one. So I get either x is zero or x is minus root two, one over root two, or x is plus one over root two. And uh, y is plus or minus one over root three. So this means that I have uh, six critical points, right? So my critical points, so this will be 0, 1 over root 3, 0, minus 1 over root 3. Yeah, I get all the combinations. 1 over root 2, 1 over root 3. 1 over root 2, minus 1 over root 3, 1 over root 2, negative, minus 1 over root 3, oops, that one's plus, 1 over root 2, okay, somewhere I screwed up the signs, it's all right, minus 1 over root 3, now I have all the combinations. So I get these six critical points, which are exactly the six points that if you look carefully you can see here, I get 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six. Right, I get the three saddles, the two local maxes, and the one local min. Yeah? What's the one in the bottom left? Yeah. Minus one over root two, plus one over root three. So I get those six possibilities. Maybe it's easier to see from the top. No, because you can't see anything with the lights on. Okay. Anyway, I get a saddle here, a saddle here, a minimum there, a local max here, a local max there, and that's a saddle here. Okay. I get an extra point. Let's call it extra point. Saddle means it goes up in one way and down in another. Right? It means, it means that so a, a saddle, you know, is what you put on a horse when you want to ride it. The horse goes up in front of you and up a little bit in back of you. Your legs go down the side. 
So it's just like a saddle. You can sit right here, your legs going down. It means that in some directions, if, if I slice it in certain directions, in some directions f will increase, and in other directions f will decrease. So it's not a local max, because for local max it needs to decrease in all directions. And it's not a local min, because for a min it needs to increase in all directions. And here, this in-between kind of point is a maximum in some ways, and a minimum in other ways. I think in uh, economics or something they call it a mini-max. <laughs> Right? Yeah. It's a weird word. But anyway. So yeah. Pants be also a saddle point? Well, it depends on which like, part of the pants. I mean, the other one. here it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> here, not so much. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're all right with that? I think I'm. I can just leave it up for a little while. So I'm going to come back to this example. Yes. No. So let me let me come back to this example. Do we need this picture up here? No. No. Uh, because you can't see it anyway. You know what it looks like. Yeah. Let me get rid of it. Uh, I think it'll go down and come back up. Right? We'll see. Maybe it'll bounce. No. Off. You gonna go up? Okay, I'll put it up when I get back there. Um, Whoa. Okay. So let's let's come back to that other example, the one that was on the screen, is on my screen, the one where we have so it didn't come back there. The one where we have x squared plus 2y squared. I think I called it g before. And I want uh, x squared plus y squared to be less than 1. So that means that I, I see uh, the thing that I want to I want to find the maximum and the minimum of this sort of bowl shape where the edges of the bowls low and high in certain places. Now from just looking at the picture it's pretty obvious that this uh, that the 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 extrema so we have the minimum here at zero 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 and that's very easy to see so the gradient of f is two x or y uh, yeah whatever like the same letter let's use the same letter it's a good idea. So the gradient of g is 2x, 4y, so we certainly see that we get uh, a critical point at the origin. And it's the minimum. Uh, might have to work a little more to see that it's actually a minimum, but it's a minimum from the picture. And then we want to see, I want to see these other points here. And so what we can do, well, what can we do? Huh? Okay, check the edges. What does that mean? Look at all the points on where x squared plus y squared is Okay, so how would we do that? I mean, I can put it on my computer, which is what we did with the picture, but... That sounds good. So parameterize the curve. Okay, I, I pointed that way, but my, I need to calibrate my fingers. Um, yeah, so, so let's look at x squared plus y squared equals 1. And 
minimize g of x, y subject to that. Let's call it star. So this curve, x squared plus y squared equals 1, I could, I suppose, solve for y, blah, 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 blah. But I could also just think of this as some function. I could just parameterize. Let's Sorry? Yeah, I would, well, yeah. I want to find the extrema just along that curve. So now I'm just looking at this circle. Okay, I'm not drawing it right. It looks like a saddle. <laughs> Uh, More like pants. <laughs> I don't know. We're just looking at we're just looking at this circle curve. So so if we write this curve x squared plus y squared equals one as cosine t sine t, that'll parameterize the circle x squared plus y squared. Let's call it gamma. Cosine t, sine t, so this is just the circle in the xy plane. And then I plug this in to the function g. Here it is. To get a function from r back to r. Right? So g of gamma of t is just going to be, well, this is g of cosine t sine t, which is just cosine squared t plus 2 sine squared t. Yeah? It's 1 plus sine squared. Huh? Isn't it just 1 plus sine squared? No, I mean, you can take it. My function yeah, yeah. g is this. Yeah, I mean, this is my function. Yeah, you simplify it. No, the 1 minus well, cosine right. squared t equals sine squared. And then you yeah, I could do that too. Whatever. So maybe it'll simplify, maybe it won't. I don't care. Especially, I don't care. <laughs> this is good enough for me. And, and so now I can just compute g prime of t. And see where it's max and min, right? So that will be at, I mean, the, the maximum. So you could write it as one little tiny bit. But, <laughs> or, so, or we could just use the chain rule, right? We could use the chain rule here to see that. So let's do it by the chain rule. So by the chain rule, the derivative of the composition d d t of g composed with gamma is going to be the gradient of g, which is 2x 4y, but it's at t, so it's really 2 cosine t or sine t. I mean, it's the same. I'm going to get exactly the same answer, but I'm doing it the other way. And I'm going to dot that with the derivative vector of my parameterization. So this will be the, the, the derivative. Uh, so that will give me negative sine t negative cos uh, plus cosine t which gives me the same answer, right? 2 cosine t sine t plus uh, 4 cosine t sine t. So this is 0 when the cosine is 0 or the sine is 0. So 
So in other words, I have critical points, as we knew already from the picture, when the cosine or the sine is zero, so I have t equals zero, t equals pi over two, t equals pi, or t equals three pi over two. Which are these four, four points right here. And then I just evaluate my function at all of the points, see where it's biggest and smallest, that gives me my max and my min. So this is exactly the same game that you go through in single variable calculus, where you find the critical points on the inside of the interval, you evaluate the function on the, at, at the end points and on all the critical points, your max is at the biggest one, your min is at the smallest one. Yeah? Why did you choose that game? Anyone, any parameterization of the circle is fine. But I wanted to parameterize the whole circle. I wanted to think about this edge curve. Somehow I have to think about this curve. And find where this curve is at its lowest and its highest. In the other case where I was restricting to a box, so suppose I wanted to do this question instead of over this circle, maybe I wanted the same question. Let's, let's change the question. I'm not going to get where I wanted to get here. Let's change the question again. Let's, let's, let's find the, I mean, again, we know the answer to this just by looking, but in harder questions, right, let's, let's find the maximum or the minimum where instead of just looking over the circle, let's say over the box, x between minus 1 and 1, y between minus 1 and 1. Then I have four subfunctions to look at. So here, over this, then I then I find the critical point at the origin and g of the origin is the origin. No problem there. And then I need to find the the extrema of the four edges the edge function g of 1, y, which is uh, 2 plus x squared. So this is for y between minus 1 and 1. And g of minus 1, y, which is the same. And g of x and plus or minus 1, just do them together, which is x squared. Something's wrong with me. Where'd that 2 come from? <laughs> I, I don't know what I did here. Sorry, this is wrong. This is x squared plus 2. These guys are the same, and I'm plugging in 1, so that's 1 plus 2y squared. But all of these are parabolas, and the maxima occur in the corners. So that means I just care about the corners, because these are all parabolas. If I had a more complicated function, then I'd have to look at more complicated stuff. Right? So I have to, so I have three potential extrema for these, here, here, and here. So I have to check those points. Does anybody want me to actually check all of those points? That's okay. Okay. You just plug in. Which is biggest? That's your max. Which is smallest? That's your min. So, so here the problem is a little more complicated. Here, for each of these boundary curves, I find, well, I get over the box, I get the corners, and I get the middles, and I get that middle. 
And then I have to check it at all of those uh, six, nine points. I have to see where the function is the biggest at all of those nine point points to find the maxima, and where it's the smallest to find the minimum. And so this is my minimum, and these guys are all the same value that they are my maximum. Again, if you just look at the picture, that's fine. But, you know, if we have a function of 12 variables and we're playing this game, it might be a little more complicated. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so if you went from R3 to R1, like yeah. if you had G of X, Y, Z, to check the edges, you would just uh, fix all the variables except for one. Are we over a square? Um, R3. So did you want... Like so if you had okay. G of X, Y, Z, like would you, to check the edges, you would just fix all the variables but one? No. You have to look at the faces. Right, so, so so let me let me not do it. But suppose my function h of x y z, I'll do one like that in a second. But is let's just do the simple case. That guy, and let's say x y and z are all between minus one and one. So I get a minimum at the origin. That's easy to check. And then what do I have to say? Well, here, x, y, and z are all less than 1. That means I'm looking at the value of the function on the unit cube. So that means I'm going to have to look at six different slices here, this face. I want to minimize the function. So let's see. Let's put some in there. So this is x equals 1, and y and z are between plus and minus 1. So that means I'm going to look at the function 1 plus y squared plus z squared with y and z between minus 1 and 1. So now I've transformed this three-dimensional problem into a two-dimensional problem. If this function were more complicated, then I would have to work hard to determine maybe whether on this square it was biggest. And here, I mean, here it's easy, right? It's smallest and, you know, it's, it's easy. The so maximum is at the corners. We're done. But if it was more complicated, I would now have this problem of maximizing or minimizing the function over this space, and over this space, and over this space, and over that space, and over the top, and over the box. So it can get annoying. But you have to consider all of those. I mean, in, uh, what's it called, operations research, in, in, a, in, in applied mathematics, often you have just linear functions that you want to maximize over complicated regions. And that's hard enough. And they're linear functions. So there, you know, there are all these theorems that they occur at the edges and at the little vertices and along the boundaries and so on. But it's hard enough just to maximize or minimize a collection of linear functions over some convex region. So this is can be a real pain in the neck. Okay. So I guess I wrote that theorem down. Let me not do the proof because I sort of said the proof. Uh, Right, the, so the theorem that I'm skipping now is one I wrote down. It says you have a function which has a local extreme value at a point inside, then the, then the gradient is zero. So I did that already. And I did that example just now. Um, there's another way to do this same kind of problem, which is a little easier, not a lot easier, but a little easier, which is called uh, Lagrange multiplier. So, so is this, is, if we can parameterize the boundary, then things get easier. Well, they get it's more straightforward. So that's one choice. Another choice is this method of Lagrange multipliers. Which I'll write it down. But it really makes most sense by uh, 
an example or two. So suppose I have some function from Rn, R is it N or M, right? And, and also, and some surface boundary, so So the, with the boundary, so I'm, I'm really just paying attention, I mean domain in the sense I just care about some box or some blobby thing, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of, I have like this, I have a cube, the cube is S, and I want to maximize so, so then, um, and, and suppose that I can write uh, is given by some function, by some function g of x, y, well, So I have some functions where uh, I'm going to describe S as being level sets. I don't need zero. So I have some function G, and S is a level set of G. Oh, yeah. Is that F or F? Then the extrema of F on the edge on boundary here occur uh, at critical points of. Mm, I need one more. Thing. I mean, no, that's so here. Notice G goes from R N to R M. So that means that G. Sorry, I skipped ahead. G looks like G one, G two, up to G M. And as I have M functions, which maybe in in, in the in the, note, in the jargon are called constraints. I have M constraints. Then the extrema of F on the edge that I care about are going to occur at the critical points of F plus lambda 1, G1, lambda 2, G2, lambda N, Gn. And they have to be subject to, obviously, that they satisfy G. Does that make any sense? No. Okay. So that means. So I'll, I'll do an example of six, and then. <laughs> so I solved that the gradient of F plus some number lambda one gradient of G one plus lambda two gradient of G two plus however many I need, lambda n m gradient of g m, that that's the zero vector, but then also g of this point is this level set. Okay, so let's do this in an example. Uh, should I explain why? Let me do it. Yeah. So, so what does this really say? Let's take let's take that example that we already did before. 
where I have my function f, well, except it wasn't flat. I have my function, I guess I called them g, now I'm going to call them f. Uh, that looks something like this. So, this curve is my g. So, in, in this example, I want to minimize, or I want to maximize, and minimize uh, f, which was x squared plus 2y squared. That was my function that I want to maximize and minimize, subject to the condition that g, which is x squared plus y squared, let's make it equal zero. Yeah. Those are m's. So here, m is 1. At one condition, I live on this circle. And this is the thing I want to maximize or minimize. And so, to use Lagrange multipliers, I would just look for, well, of course I would look for my critical point on the inside. That's the easy part. So I'd find this guy. And now I want to worry, and draw it. I want to worry, I want to find these guys here, 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 here. And the way I'm going to find those guys is I'm going to look at, let's call this, I have too many F's and G's. I'm going to call them F and M. So I look at the gradient of F plus some number lambda times the gradient of G, figure out where that's zero. Notice I have an extra variable now, right? This is a function And I also need also, also need also, and, and two I also need, um, that g of that point has to be zero. So x squared. So here I have now, this is two, this is, this is something in three variables. But I'll find two of them because this is a gradient. So this is really two equations and three unknowns. And there's the third equation. So that'll give me my solutions. This is sort of a not a great example to illustrate it, but let me do it anyway. So in this case, my Lagrange function that I want is I, the gradient of f was 2x. Well, let's just write it. So, what I want to do is I want to take the gradient of x squared plus 2y squared plus lambda x squared plus y squared minus 1. I want to take that gradient and set it to 0. So I have three variables here, x, y, and lambda. The gradient here is easy. This is 2x plus lambda 2 lambda x. That's my first component. My second component is 4y plus 2 lambda y. And that has to be 0. Did I do that right? Did I make a mistake? I'm not. I'm only taking the gradient. I'm thinking of lambda is a parameter. Okay. So I don't take a gradient with respect to lambda. I just take the gradient here. Because um, it's really lambda <laughs> gradient of g, not gradient. So I take the gradient, and then multiply by lambda, if you will. 
Uh, and so that tells me then that I have three things I have to set. Oops. Oh well. <laughs> All right. I have to satisfy. Sorry, I know what it says. Too bad that you don't. Uh, so I have to satisfy 2x times 1 plus lambda equals 0. That's this. This says 2y, no, somewhere I've, 2y times 2. I can't factor it now. 2y times 2 plus lambda equals 0, thank you. And then I also need that I satisfy x squared plus y squared equals 1. So let me save the x squared plus y squared equals 1 for a minute. So when I look at this, this tells me that either x is 0 or lambda is negative 1. So for that, that's what I need. And here, lambda is negative 2 or y is 0. And obviously, I can't have both lambda equal to negative 1 and negative 2 at the same time. Uh, so if x is 0 and y is 0, then I also need 0 squared plus 0 squared equals 1. That doesn't happen much. So I can rule that one out. So either x is 0 or y is 0, but not both. I don't really care what lambda is. It was just an extra thing laying around. So this tells me that either x is 0 or y is 0, not both. And so that tells me that I'm on, here's my circle. I'm either here, 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 or here. So I just check those four points, and I'm done. OK? Lambda ever have any significance at all, or is it just it's sort it's just of that extra thing that you throw in and then you hear about? I mean, sometimes you solve for lambda and lambda. I mean, I'll do an example. <coughs> Finding lambda actually tells us where things are. But so this is one we already knew the answer. But the advantage of your first exposure is something where you know the answer and you know that it's right. So that's a good thing. All right, let me move over here. This will be all the way over there. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me let me explain for a minute why, and then I'll do a more complicated example. So, why why would this? Yeah. So, using this method, does that give you critical points or actual restricted points? It gives you the it gives you the critical points of the restricted function. Right. So so it's it's similar to this kind of method. Except they didn't have to parameterize the boundary. So this saves me having to find to parameterize the boundary. Because sometimes it's hard to parameterize the boundary. So here, I just have some conditions, and I don't really care for some nice representation of that condition. Especially if I have like two or three conditions. Then it's a real pain in the neck to try and express that, to find the you know, the intersection of all of those conditions. If you have two or three conditions, if you have two or three, then it's really multiple. Yeah, I'll do an example of that in just a second. So I want to, six minutes. Um, yeah, I want to, let me just, the re, why does this work? Yeah, okay, you can tell me. Good. I have an idea, I'm not sure that. Okay. Uh, something about the slope at the minimum yeah. has to be equal to the contour line going around the thing, and then I think the yeah. grading is perpendicular to the it, It's because, the, right. So so let me draw the one variable case. I, I'm not even going to try and draw the entire variable case. So here's my, my constraint, my level curve, right? So f looks something like this. These are the level curves of it. <coughs> um, 
and G is some other level curve. So in this case, gradient map goes this way. And if, if I meant some tangent vector to G, which comes through this point, well, they're going to match up at a maximum, at a critical point. The gradient vector of G will be here. And they're pointing in opposite directions. So if I take some, if I take some unit vector here, U, the dot product here, not, that's not that kind of um, the dot product of these two things are zero. So because, because the gradients are normal, well, the, the gradient is normal to the level curves of G, so I have to be both on the level curve of G and at the biggest piece of X, then they have to be perpendicular. So it's what you say. And, and in higher dimensions, it, you know, these things are, I have, here are the values of G, and here are some other values of G. But again, we have a something similar. Let me skip that. Oh, there's that picture. Okay, so let me do another example here. Uh, let's do one with two conditions because I don't have much time. Yeah. No. Sorry. Uh, come on. I had one worked out with two conditions. Okay, good. So let's. Uh, Suppose I want to maximize something simple. Say I want to maximize f of x, y, z is x squared plus, I think one of them was minus, no, okay, x plus y plus z. So I want to maximize the sum of, not squared, just the sum of x, y, and z. And I want this to be, so subject to, so this is along the intersection, <coughs> I'll just write it, just say subject to. Both conditions that, uh, what did I use here? x squared plus y squared, same thing, zero, and also z is two. So, so here I want to maximize the sum of the three coordinates where x and y live on a circle and z is at exactly two. So then I can just set this up, so my Lagrange multipliers, So I guess I could parameterize this still, but let's not. Um, by Lagrange multipliers, then what I want to look at, I want to take the gradient of f plus lambda times this guy. And now I need another guy, let's call it mu, times uh, z minus 2. So I want that to be zero. And then also, let's call this G2 and G2. So I need the solutions to this. This is five variables, but then also subject to those two constraints. So when I take the when I take the uh, gradient here, I'm going to get one I'm doing it with respect to x plus two lambda x, and that one's gone, so that has to be zero. And then with respect to y, I get one plus two two lambda y is zero. And then with respect to z, I get mu is zero. Uh, what? Oh, one plus mu. Right. So I get one from here plus mu is zero. So this tells me that x. So what does that mean? 
x is 1 over 2 lambda, negative 1 over 2 lambda, y is negative 1 over 2 lambda, and u is negative 1. I don't know anything about it. But I also know that z is 2 just from my constraint. Um, wait a minute, what did I do wrong here? I don't need this. Sorry. So if I, if I, somewhere, I lost a minus sign. Why did I have a minus sign and now I don't? 2 lambda x minus y. Yeah, so if I subtract this minus this, this tells me that 2 lambda x minus y is 0. Right? And mu doesn't matter. So this tells me that either lambda is 0 or x is y. And mu is minus 1, which falls out of this, and z is 2, so we're kind of done. And so now I've lost my place. Okay, so, so now I just can plug this. If x equals minus y, uh, okay, I've just lost my brand. Yeah, if x equals y, then I have 2x squared equals 1. So x is plus or minus 1 over root 2, and x equals y. Two. So again, I get uh, well, I get several critical points out of that. Yeah. Oh, this is the point of the lambda and the multipliers just so that it can cancel out the original gradient to make zero. You know, like just, like just well, there's so that the, the constraints can be sort of involved in the game. So what? So that we can actually use these constraints. So we didn't have the lambda and the mu, then we couldn't. Right. Yeah. So I guess it's so that so that this won't necessarily be right on the edge, right? <laughs> we want to create critical points of a lower dimensional thing. So, so it enables us to create these critical points. All right. And I guess I had yeah, I'll save that for later. So I guess next time I will talk about the analog.